BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. All right, hello everybody, and welcome to this special weekend presentation of Black Box Online Radio. Last week on the channel, I made the announcement that I had started a new series on the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey from 1996, and I had launched this book discussion on Presumed Guilty by Stephen Singular. And if you haven't heard part one yet, that's fine. You can keep listening. I always want these multi-part discussions to be available to anybody jumping in the middle or listening to it from the beginning, or you can even start at part two if that's what you're doing right now. But I hope you will listen to the, all the episodes at some point, if you have not. And we left off last week, at the end of 1996. Jean Benet Ramsey was murdered, and she was found in the basement of her family's Colorado home. The only people that were supposed to have been in the house were the Ramsey family. But could an intruder have done it? Those are the questions that were explored in part one. And but because this is a book called Presumed Guilty by Stephen Singular, it's going to focus on a possibility outside of the Ramsey family. Could there have been a sex ring that was targeting girls for very malicious activities done to children? And I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm trying to be careful with my words. But on January 1st of 1997, the Ramseys did something that a lot of people have been bothered by even to this day. That is a television appearance that they had on CNN, and I'd like to pick up exactly where last, last week left off. The day after Jean Benet Ramsey's funeral, January 1st, 1997, John and Patsy appeared on the CNN cable TV network and proclaimed their innocence to a captivated nationwide audience while offering a $50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of Jean Benet's killer. John Ramsey appeared fairly normal on TV. If a bit strained around the eyes and mouth, he looked like a corporate executive trained in crisis management who was trying to cope with a very tough public relations problem. Almost from the moment the body had been discovered, he had followed the advice of Mike Bynum, a lawyer friend in Boulder, and began putting together an expensive legal team to protect himself and his wife from activities or allegations on the part of the Boulder police or legal system. He told CNN that since December of... Since December 26th, he and Patsy had been cooperating with the police. And to be clear, um, that means that he had told them during the interview, this is the first interview, and I, I, I know that sentence is worded a little bit awkwardly, but I don't think it means that he was talking to the police and to CNN on December 26th. I don't think CNN was involved at that point. They had, in fact, given hair, blood, and handwriting samples to the authorities, but had not yet appeared for a formal interview with them. John said that they shared all their thoughts with detectives about who could have committed the crime, but for now, they had no answer. Patsy sat beside him, looking dreadful. She had the half-open eyes of someone who had been crying nonstop and taking sedatives. Indeed, she had consumed possibly a dangerous amount of Valium in the past few days, if she didn't seem fully conscious or aware of herself on television, she didn't convey the emotion that her husband did. She called John Bonet daddy's girl and referred to her boulder home as a hellhole, vowing to never live there again. The Ramseys left their home at the end of December 1996. 
And I think that there's something that needs to be addressed immediately. Because, firstly, the general public will pounce on these types of behaviors if they don't like the way that someone is conducting themselves in an interview, maybe they have shifty eyes, maybe they're hesitating, maybe they're mumbling, maybe they don't have perfect articulation. People in the general public will zone in on those factors and think that the person is guilty. But that doesn't mean anything. What's my favorite saying? Being weird is not a crime. Just because someone appeared sleepy-eyed on television does not mean that she murdered her daughter. And in fact, I think that a lot of people are getting away from the Patsy Ramsey theory, or the theory that Patsy was the sole participant in orchestrating the murder of her own daughter. But I just simply wanted to point out that no matter what theory people have about the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey, just because someone appeared to be a little out of touch with reality during a TV interview after one of their children had been murdered does not mean that they are guilty of murder. Just because someone had taken Valium doesn't mean that she was guilty of murder or even covering up a murder. All that means is that she had taken Valium and she appeared sleepy-eyed on television. But no matter what, the general public is not going to listen to me on that. They're just going to be like, no, no, her eyes are half closed, that means that she's guilty of something. And I think that it's almost beating a dead horse at that point. But I'd like to jump ahead in Stephen Singular's book to move on to this page here that says, there were only four known people in the residence that night, John, Patsy, their nine-year-old son, Burke, and Jean Benet. Most commentators reason that Burke could not have built a garrote and carried out such a gruesome crime alone, or penned the detailed note. There were no definitive signs of forced entry, and no definitively fresh footprints in the dusting of snow in the Ramsey's yard. In addition, the Ramseys had refused to sit down individually with the police at a formal interrogation. Didn't that make them guilty right there? So I think that that is somewhat of a sarcastic question, because Stephen Singular will, of course, explore a different theory, although, although this one will possibly have a connection to the Ramseys that they are... Had, that they had knowledge of Jean Bonnet being involved with the people, or the the people from this sex ring having involvement with Jean Bonnet, they had knowledge of that, participants, perhaps, but the sole participants, no. Let's look at this list again. There are only four known people in the house, John Ramsey, Patsy Ramsey, Burke, and Jean Bonnet. So does that just end it there, hook, line, and sinker. It couldn't have been an intruder. Last week on the channel, I was saying some very critical things of Lou Smith, the investigator who followed this case, perhaps most famously in terms of people outside of the Ramsey family and in terms of investigators and sleuths that were trying to get the answers in the Jean Benet case. He might be the first name that comes to mind for some people. But to the credit of Lou Smith, going in a different direction... He showed how easily it would have been to break into the Ramsey's home, did a full crime scene reconstruction without showing major signs of forced entry, entering through a basement window and so on, how all of that could have been done. And to the majority of people who think that an intruder murdered John Bonet, they add the condition that it was most likely someone very close to the family. When I did the Q&A session, last year about the Jean Benet Ramsey case, giving a shout out to Mark Hewitt, who is the author of Hunted, Profiled, and Exposed about the Zodiac Killer, as well as Charles Manson Behind Bars. He wrote something into the comment section here on Black Box Online Radio, and that was that the person who wrote the ransom note used a marker pen from the house, and it was someone that belonged to the Ramseys, and after they were done writing this two-and-a-half-page ransom note, they put the cap back on the marker pen and then returned it to the cup where it had been taken from in the first place. That is very significant of someone who had familiarity with the Ramses, with the household, and it doesn't necessarily mean a family member. However, someone who had an intense familiarity with the location 
And I do agree with that. I mean, I really don't have a lot of nasty pushback because I'm being very blunt with you guys. I do not think one of the family members murdered Jean Benet. I do think it was an intruder who had a familiar connection to the family. But let's go back to Stephen Singular's list here. There are four known people in the residence that night, John, Patsy, Burke, and Jean Benet. Most commentators reason that Burke could not have built a garage and carried out such a gruesome crime alone or penned the detailed note. All right, now we have to stop there because, again, giving, to, giving credit to people that I disagree with, I don't think Burke Ramsey murdered John Bonet, but to the people who say that he did, in almost every single variant of that theory, they do not say that Burke Ramsey wrote the ransom note. They say that Patsy did. So this whole sentence here shouldn't even be in the book. That, oh, well, yeah, well, most uh, people reason that Burke Ramsey didn't write the ransom note. Of course not. We uh, Almost nobody thinks that. I've never encountered anyone who thinks that. And if somebody does think that, they are probably on the absolute fringe of the true crime world. But again, I don't even know if such a person exists. What they say is that Jean Benet and Burke got into some type of argument. Jean Benet may have even been playing around. Burke was sitting at the kitchen table, the raised table, actually, eating pineapple covered in milk. Jean Benet stole a piece of his pineapple, and then they, he started chasing her around, grabbed a blunt object, and then hit her with it. And then the family thought, oh no, we've lost, Bur we've lost Jean Benet, we can't lo lose Burke too. So they concocted this ridiculous plan of staging the scene to make it look like an intruder, and Patsy Ramsey is the one who wrote the ransom note. And, I mean, that theory gets modified a little bit, but Patsy becomes the prime suspect in that particular angle. But I do also stand by the point that I don't think that Burke could have created the garrote by himself, and, I mean, that's just something that I think is too complicated for a nine-year-old who is just short of his tenth birthday to have created. Now... There was um, a discussion that I had with somebody named Tina L., that's her YouTube name, and we were talking about the Burke Ramsey murder theory last year, and she talked about how Burke Ramsey may have learned a knot from the Scouts, either the end of Cub Scouts, maybe the beginning of Boy Scouts, but being nine years old, most likely the end of Cub Scouts, wee blows, and he could have learned the clove hitch knot, and then tied that around the stick, trying to move Jean Benet after she had been knocked unconscious in what uh, is called a, using a toggle rope. And I am an Eagle Scout. However, that was a long time ago, my friends, and uh, some of that knowledge did leak out of my brain because I told Tina mistakenly that the clove hitch is used for two pieces of wood, not one. There's only one piece of wood in the garage. Okay, that's not completely true. In fact, that's not true at all. I made a mistake. I had forgotten something. It happens from time to time. But yes, a clovefish can be tied around one piece of wood. It can be tied around one stick or one log. The reason why I said two is when I was in the Scouts, we primarily used the clovefish knot to lash together multiple pieces of wood to build outdoor structures, bushcraft, as well as you can use it for even just basic wilderness survival. Normally, multiple pieces of wood get added onto it. However, a clovefish can be tied around one piece of wood or one stick or one object. And um, there's a very big discussion on this in the movie The Clovehitch Killer, which tells the story of Dylan McDermott pretending to uh, be a nice, gentle person. And in reality, he's a serial killer that is based on BTK, he's called Clove Hitch in the movie, or the Clove Hitch Killer, buddy that was based on the life of Dennis Rader, I have an episode about that, but um, I digress from that one. The whole point is that Burke could have been the assailant in their theory, in their theory, who hit Jean Benet, but almost certainly the parents would have been covering up his actions, and I don't think this paragraph truly represents what the majority of people are thinking. Now, the final note on that does not come from Lou Smith. Lou Smith has since passed away. But Lou Smith's granddaughters are continuing with his sleuthing, and they are trying to investigate 
what happened to Jean Benet, and they gave one of the strongest takedowns of any theory involving the Ramses, saying, in almost all accounts of the Ramses being the killer, John Patsy Orberg, it's just somebody gave somebody a ding on the head too hard, and they made a silly story to cover it up. Is that what really happened to Jean Benet? And I do not believe so. And Lou Smith's daughters do a podcast on Jean Benet. I'd like to keep going in the book. A hundred days later, the district attorney was not sure. Jean Benet's parents, Hunter said, as we sat together in his office, have done almost nothing to help this thing out. Why would innocent people act this way? I don't know, I replied, I being Stephen Singular. They obviously don't trust the cops or me. They may feel a lot of guilt over the daughter's death, and this has made them quiet or even more afraid, and I think Patsy feels guilty about dressing up Jean Benet in a grown woman's clothes and putting her in those beauty pageants. I can understand how she would feel that way. He made some remarks about the quality of people that the Ramses seemed to be. While I remained silent, I was very taken by the fact that Hunter was thinking through his conundrum with a virtual stranger and a journalist at that. The rest of the world may have been staring at the surface of the crime and jumping to conclusions, but the DA appeared to be attempting something else. He was drawing on his lifelong experience as a prosecutor, a man, a husband, and a father, in order to understand what he was confronting. He was utilizing his common sense and his deep political instincts. One of the most powerful rumors in the case was the semen that was found on Jean Benet's body, along with the reports that she had chronic irritation of vaginal tissues and had been penetrated, even though the penetration could have been done by someone outside the Ramsey family, by a foreign object, or even by a child, meaning Jean Benet herself. Many people instantly decided that she had been molested by her father. Jean Benet's bedroom was on the second floor of the spacious home and a considerable distance away from her parents' bedroom on the third floor. In March of 1997, such gossip inspired Paul Hidalgo, a 21-year-old student at the University of Colorado's Boulder campus, to create a very loosely described work of art by arranging three photographs of Jean Bonnet on a wall at school called Daddy's Little Hooker. Well, that's an absolute poor taste thing to do. Even if he's trying to get a particular point across, he should not say something like that, or I don't believe he should say something like that because it's making some type of inappropriate insinuation about the murder victim and... No matter what, Jean Benet seemed to have gone through a lot of emotional turmoil in her life, even though it was very short, only six years, the pressure of the pageants, the bedwetting, and so on. And, as most people speculate about, some type of physical or sexual abuse. And that I just don't believe that that is a good way to remember this particular murder victim. To respond to some of these points here, number one, Patsy feels guilt about putting Jean Benet in the beauty pageants. In part one, I said very clearly, Patty was a former beauty queen of Miss West Virginia herself. I think it was just something she wanted to share with Jean Benet before she passed away from cancer, and she most likely knew that she was, wasn't going to live much longer. Patsy Ramsey did live for several years well after this crime, but she passed away as after um, her cancer came back. And I think she was fully aware that that was going to happen, and that was just something she wanted to share with her daughter. What is much more important is it's not the pageants themselves. It's not the photographs themselves. It's not the imagery itself or anything from the beauty contestant world. Instead, it's the fact that after Jean Benet was murdered, the family chose to share so many of Jean Benet's beauty pageant imagery publicly. And people thought that that was a very odd choice because they are showing all of these somewhat provocative photos to the world. And this is a world that doesn't completely have familiarity on the way that kids act in beauty pageants. I don't even know how kids act in beauty pageants. There was a show called Toddlers and Tiaras. I never watched it. And all we know is that some people become pageant moms and they become very, very overbearing with this. And even to the point where it can be somewhat abusive and controlling. 
But it, they again, they just thought that it was something very outrageous. It seemed inappropriate in the minds of the general public. And to a certain extent, the general public may have been right about that, that it just served as an enormous distraction from the murder. Now on to the next point, that John Ramsey has to be the one who sexually assaulted his daughter. I think that there are just some questions that law enforcement is going to have to answer, that law enforcement has to answer, and that is going to be one of them. I mean, again, that makes sense, right? Right? But the hard evidence will be something that will have to answer that question, and I don't really want to say any more on that. Something else from the book. In recent months, because the authorities had not been able to find any evidence of John Ramsey as a molester or an a pornographer, or that there were any criminal leanings whatsoever, the media speculation began to shift toward Patsy. She had killed the child because Jean Benet had been a bedwetter, and that she had finally been pushed beyond her motherhood limits. Or Patsy had just completed chemotherapy treatments for stage 4 ovarian cancer, which has a mortality rate of 95%, that had left her irrational and violently out of control. Well, um... I don't even want to entertain that last sentence, and um, no, I don't think that that would have been it. Or because Patsy, who kept an open Bible near her bed, was a religious fanatic who had sacrificed her daughter on Christmas night as a kind of twisted gift to the Lord. Definitely not even entertaining that. I mean, like, where, where are people getting this stuff from? That, again, is something that you would need even harder evidence to back up. And I'm going to be 110% honest with you guys. This theory that John Ramsey, her father, was the person who molested her, that is somewhat of a comprehensible theory. I mean, that's not the most ridiculous accusation in the world. Oh, well, John has no record of being a molester or a pornographer. Big deal. So what? He still could have done it, and he would be somewhat of a reasonable suspect in that exact scenario. However, Patsy Ramsey murdered her daughter as a twisted gift to the Lord on Christmas night. That's even more far out. That is a more extreme allegation. There are these types of theories that people have where, I mean, okay, it's possible, we just don't have the evidence to support that, versus something that is so ridiculous that it doesn't even deserve strong consideration. And I think that we're going to have to do a lot of separation in this exact case. During the past five years, Stephen Singular has written three books about women who had killed, and in each case, not only dress rehearsals in which the per perpetrators were quite able to bring themselves to commit the final act, but they just weren't able to do so immediately, but also disruptive behaviors and a build-up to violence had preceded the slayings. None of these elements seem to apply in Jean Bonnet's murder, in the past 100 days, and continuing throughout the coming several hundred more, not one person had merged with a single anecdote suggesting parental abuse. Well, that doesn't mean anything at all. I mean, again, the stuff happens behind closed doors. The whole point is that they would have to have been keeping it a secret. I know, I know what some of you are thinking. Ah, well, if it's secretive, how does anybody know about it? Moving on to beyond just the p possibility of doubt... I mean, it's always possible. I mean, parents don't have to abuse their children in public. They can do it in private when no one else is around. That's how they get away with it. If that were true, how could there be a motiveless crime? And John, um, Stephen Singular here is under perhaps a few misapprehensions that, okay, he's written three books on female murderers, and always there's a dress rehearsal or... They are just trying to push themselves over the edge. They have the ability to do so. They just have to convince and prepare themselves that they're going to unleash these destructive tendencies at a certain time. That's telling criminals that they have to follow a rule book. That is telling perpetrators that they have to behave in a certain way. But to you regular listeners of Black Box Online Radio... How many times have you heard me say that criminals do not follow the rules? They break them. That's why they're criminals in the first place. And more importantly, more importantly, 
even if I w will concede that this could follow some type of particular psychopathology or this could follow some particular type of behavioral profiling, that's, that's not what a woman would have done. Well, there were two other people in the house, Burke and John Ramsey, most notably John Ramsey in these theories that we've been discussing. And again, I don't really think anyone... Okay, I shouldn't say that. Most people don't think that Patsy Ramsey even would have committed the crime 100% by herself, and John Ramsey just had no knowledge of it, and that Patsy wrote the ransom note, Patsy did the creating of the garage stage, the scene, all of that. And I said most because I think I did find one YouTube video somewhere where some guy was doing a podcast rather similar to this one in terms of its format when he shared his theory involving Patsy Ramsey. But I do not think that it was very convincing, because that's back to what the Smith girl said. Somebody gave somebody else a ding on the head too hard, and then they made a silly story to cover it up. I genuinely don't believe that that's what was going on. Now, in the later parts of the book, we'll explore a theory such as, did intruders break into the house and have Jean Benet murdered, and then do so because of a sexually motivated crime? That, I think, deserves a little bit more examination. Not even consideration at this point, but examination. So, um, on to the next part. This was no accident, and it was not a superficial wound on the neck. The garrote left an impression in Jean Benet's body, in her flesh. Whoever did this was very strong and intended to harm her. It was a vicious act. I held my silence as he stared off into the distance. Somebody at a photo shoot, he said, may have asked Jean Benet to take off her clothes and said that she was going to tell her mommy. That would have been trouble. I need to look into this internet business. I nodded. Can you learn more about it, he said. The internet? I asked. Yes. I thought that was an unusual request, but I told him I would see what I could do. If you find out anything, Hunter said, walking me to the door, let us know right away. We shook hands, and he thanked me for coming in. As I was leaving, he dropped a remark that underscored the entire case and revealed that the depths of his dilemma. The Boulder police had failed to treat the Ramsey home as a crime scene and failed to accept assistance from the far more experienced Denver Police Department, which handles roughly a hundred homicides a year compared to Boulder's one or two, and they failed to employ the expertise of the Mobile Crime Lab of the Colorado Bureau of Investigation and failed to consider John and Patsy Ramsey as suspects. All right, all right, leaving out the part about John and Patsy Ramsey as suspects, I would like to talk about the preceding sentences, the preceding material, and that is that in so many of these unsolved true crime cases, we actually find answers to some questions. Why were they unsolved? Why have they been unsolved for so long? And the answer is that the authorities have made critical errors in the investigation, and the evidence that could have solved the case may have been compromised, or in some instances it may have been contaminated or even destroyed. If Commander John Eller had supervised a murder investigation, neither... Oh, if Commander John Eller had never supervised a murder investigation, neither had Police Chief Kobe, who had learned that this trade working robberies in Houston, the FBI would have eventually arrived at the Ramsey home and offered help, but not in time to prevent John Ramsey and Fleet White from finding the body and altering the evidence in the basement. And as I said, another critical piece of error in the investigation was Linda Arndt allowed John Ramsey to place a white blanket over Jean Benet's body, which more or less purely, purely contaminated any chance of finding uh, exact fibers from the killer. I'm not going to give information to the cops right away, Hunter said, as we stood in the doorway, because I don't want them to screw it up. Well, that also is its own problem. That's a different kettle of fish. Somebody has info, but they don't want to cooperate because they want to be the ones to do it. Well, I mean, if he's successful, more power to him, but I don't think that he's been very successful. Unsolved case until this day. But I would like to recap some of the points, and closing the book here for a second presumed guilty by Stephen Singular. 
I would like to recap some of the points that I've been talking to you guys about. Number one is that if the Ramses were the assailants and the Ramses alone, I think that they would have been working together. I do not find any plausible theory that just entertains one single participant, particularly Patsy by herself or Burke by herself, John Ramsey by himself. That's a little bit more understandable. But Patsy Ramsey or Burke Ramsey acting without family assistance? No. But I, th I think in this chapter that I was just reading with you guys, Stephen Singular made it present like that's how other people think. They think that that there's this large portion of the um, investigative community that thinks that Burke Ramsey did the whole thing by himself. I don't believe that that's widely accepted. Even with Patsy Ramsey as a suspect, it's not widely accepted that she did everything on her own. I mean, perhaps the composition of the ransom note, but almost certainly John Ramsey would have aided in covering up for her. Now, on to the second point, that there's no evidence from an intruder. Well, an intruder who had an intense familiarity with the house would have known how to enter and get out without leaving an enormous amount of evidence, and that could have um, been done to enter the credit of Lou Smith. He showed that that was indeed possible. And on to the final point. The Ramses did display odd behavior after the murder of Jean Bonnet, but that should not be significant of any fact or conclusion. Do you agree or disagree with any of the statements that I've made in this episode? Please put your ideas in the comment section down below. I would love to read them. And please tune in next week as we will continue to explore Stephen Singular's presumed guilty and investigation into the Jean Bonnet Ramsey case and the media and the culture of pornography. And let's also add in a final point. Just because no one had any knowledge of the Ramseys abusing Jean Bonnet well, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. I mean, we're talking about the truth here. We're not talking about, well, I mean, what evidence can you bring into a court of law tomorrow? No. Like, what do you genuinely think happened? Because people don't always abuse their children in front of witnesses. I mean, I think that that's a rather obvious statement. But again, this part of presumed guilty makes it seem like that's what it would have had to have happened. Oh, yeah, well, um, you know, everybody in town would have known about it if John Bonet had been abused by her parents. No, absolutely not. So, calling every issue as I see it, and I would like you guys to do the same, please put your ideas in the comment section down below. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnid88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.